The great arc of human history over the past four centuries has been characterized by a stupendous project to reduce the world to quantity. Quantum physics, our foundational science, would reduce the world to quantum particles. Evolutionary biology would reduce living organisms to aggregates of such particles, resulting from random, stochastic, and deterministic processes. Whilst post-Einsteinian cosmology would reduce the cosmos itself to random fluctuations in the quantum vacuum. The reign of quantity is reaching its full measure, which turns out also to be its reductio ad absurdum. It is time to take stock of what has befallen us. Time to break the spell. By the time the quantum reality debate had passed the half century mark without a semblance even of a resolution in sight, it became apparent that something was seriously amiss. It was at this point that Wolfgang Smith became interested in this fateful conundrum. It was in the 90s, after I had for some time perused this curious literature, that I was struck by what proved to be a decisive recognition. It became evident to me that all these quantum reality theorists unbeknownst to themselves, had assumed the highly dubious premises of René Descartes, the supposition, namely, that the real splits neatly into two disjoint domains, an external world consisting of so-called res extense, or extended entities, and an internal or subjective domain pertaining to so-called res cogitantes, or thinking entities. I felt that I had discovered the source of the difficulty, the hidden premise which has all along bedeviled the quantum reality debate. It doesn't mean that the physicists are conscious of that. I mean, many of them perhaps have not even heard of René Descartes, <gasps> but unconsciously they have, and I would almost say to a man, absorbed that philosophy. What is characteristic of the external de domain and in a way defines it is that it is populated with objects which can be described completely without residue in mathematical terms. So therefore, everything which pertains to the realm of qualities had to be eliminated from the external world. He relegated these qualitative parameters to a subjective world, which he referred to as a world of res cogitantes, thinking entities. So as it were, by force, he eliminated the qualities, he pushed them over, out of the way, so to speak, in order to produce a world which would be ideal for the mathematical physicists. And this is what enables them to take a corporeal object, a piece of stone or a piece of organic tissue or whatever it may be, and say, this is nothing but quantum particles. They could not say that if they did not assume that the qualities, for example, the color red, is subjective. The educated strata of our society have been condemned to a chronic state of schizophrenia. This is schizophrenia. One moment the grass is green, the next moment it is not. That's exactly what schizophrenia is. So that is not a healthy condition. And I realized it and I wrote about it. So uh, once we had uh, corrected all these errors, based upon a residual Cartesianism, we were delivered from schizophrenia. We could then be normal human beings, totally sane, and yet do physics. So that is one thing that came out of this work, namely the clear 
ontological discernment between two ontological planes, the, the corporeal plane which we perceive, which defines the world in which we find ourselves, and then this physical universe, which you can say is half discovered, half constructed by the physicist, that's another world. What then is the quantum enigma? It resides in the fact that there are no actual particles in the quantum world. That actual particles come into existence abruptly in the act of observation or measurement. So, what is there before measurement? Not a thing. There is something more involved, and that something more is tantamount to what the Platonists term essence, and to mystic philosophy knows as substantial form. The concept of substance has disappeared from fundamental physics. It thus became apparent that the act of observation or measurement has a profound and inherently unpredictable impact upon the physical system itself. An undeniable fact which physicists could not explain and which moreover gave rise to unending speculations on the part of a philosophically interested minority, which however includes some of the most illustrious names beginning with the famous Bohr-Einstein debate in 1927. It is hardly surprising that some quantum theorists have proposed that ordinary logic does not apply in the quantum domain. What is needed, they say, is a quantum logic. Since these structures consist exclusively in quantities, they cannot bring us into the world where we perceive qualities, green grass and red apples and the songs of birds. Qualities pertain to essence, and thus to being, no less. The fact is that nothing bereft of qualities can actually exist. Today, the only way left is upwards. The resolution of the quantum enigma by Wolfgang Smith commences with what might be termed the rediscovery of the corporeal world, the world of perception, where the grass really is green. But once we have broken free from the Cartesian bifurcation, we're left once again with a dichotomy, with two domains, the corporeal world, in which we live and move and have our being, and the physical universe, the world as conceived by the physicist. It turns out that there exists one and only one function, S, from the corporeal to the physical domain, which can serve as a bridge, one which is in fact in constant use since otherwise no science of the physical would be possible. S is the function which to every corporeal object X assigns the physical object SX, which is none other than the corporeal object X as conceived by the physicist. SX represents the quantitative side of X to the exclusion of all else. What has been jettisoned, to put it in Aristotelian and Thomistic terms, are precisely the qualitative attributes of X and its substantial form. Brilliantly, uh, Wolfgang Smith separates the corporeal world from the physical world. Establishes great contribution yes. to show that the corporeal world, first of all, is not simply the based on, you might say, or the reduction of the physical world. It's another set of being. That's a very, very important contribution, the ontological jump. One can aggregate as many potentiae as one pleases. They of themselves cannot bring us across the bridge 
from the realm of potential to the realm of act, from the physical or quantum realm to the corporeal universe. What actually stands at issue is a fundamental and hitherto unrecognized mode of causation, vertical causation, which in fact is more basic than physical causality. The existence of vertical causation was confirmed in 1998 by a mathematician named William Dembski, whose story we need to tell next. In 1998, this hitherto unknown mathematician startled the erudite world with a theorem that has revolutionized our scientific understanding of causality. Dembski introduced an idea which proves to be crucial, the notion of specified information. Whereas every event produces information, Dembski sharpens this concept drastically by two innovations. First, the notion of a detachable target, followed by the imposition of a probability bound large enough to exclude accidental hits. The information generated by events meeting these two conditions is termed complex specified information. In a word, CSI is information generated by an event which, like an arrow striking a bullseye, meets a highly restrictive condition. With these basic definitions in place, William Dembski was able to prove one of the most remarkable theorems in the history of mathematics. Namely, that no combination of natural causes, random, deterministic, or stochastic, can produce CSI. Neither a book, nor even a simple artifact, let alone the genome of an organism, can be produced by horizontal causes alone. The vertical causation necessary to resolve the quantum enigma proves to be ubiquitous. The discovery of vertical causation as operative throughout nature, from the measurement of a quantum system to biogenesis to the making of a water pot, has de jure invalidated the post-Galilean worldview and brought to an end the period known as the Enlightenment. The scientistic war on vertical causality has in fact assumed two corresponding forms, epitomized respectively by Darwinian biology and Einsteinian physics. The Darwinist hypothesis has actually been rigorously disproved on the strength of Dembski's design inference theorem which establishes once and for all that the tons of complex specified information, or CSI, contained in the genome of even the simplest living organism cannot be generated by horizontal modes of causality, period. Darwinism thus, as a scientific theory, came to an end in the fateful year 1998, when William Dembski established his spectacular result. We contend next that Einsteinian physics wars against cosmic vertical causality. Einstein, in his famous 1905 paper introducing special relativity, mentioned the, quote, unsuccessful attempts to detect any motion of the Earth relative to the light medium, unquote. Only a few years before, the famous Michelson-Morley experiment had attempted to measure the orbital motion of the Earth around the Sun. And to the great perplexity of the physics community, had failed to detect any such motion. Because of this failure, the equations of physics were rewritten to explain this apparent lack of orbital motion of the Earth. What motivated Einstein evidently was the conviction that the Earth, or equivalently reference frames stationary with respect to the Earth, 
could have no preferential status, that in other words, there can be no design or architecture on a cosmic scale. In 2014, I was involved in the release of a film entitled The Principle, which dealt with the fundamental assumption of standard cosmology, the so-called Copernican Principle, which simply states that we are in no special or central location with regard to the large-scale structure of the cosmos. The Principle deals with the stunning recent observational evidence to the contrary. And of all the benefits which have accrued to me from making that film, the greatest, I think, is that it is the means by which I met Wolfgang Smith. I interviewed him for the very first time, and he had some very interesting things to say about the principle. Your film comes into this moment of history and captures it, captures it in a masterful way. You have, first of all, the documentary evidence. You can see the microwave background. Colors show the different temperature regions, the so-called axis of evil. Well, the fact that this microwave background turns out to have a well-defined axis negates the fundamental assumption on which all of our astrophysics has been based for the last 60 or more years, number one. And number two, the fact that this axis lines up with the ecliptic of our solar system is almost an insult following injury. It takes us right back to pre-Galilean cosmology. Our solar system is central. So this has enormous significance. I mean, uh, you, you, you could not possibly overstate the scientific and philosophical and cultural impact of this discovery. There is an absoluteness, and Wolfgang is completely right about this, absoluteness about the direction of space, about our experience of space from the Earth, of dimensions of space. And this is to the great ready credit of Wolfgang Smith to brought this out so clearly. The vertical always symbolizes transcendence. You know, even ordinary people who are atheists, and they're happy to go like yeah. this. <laughs> They don't go like this. <laughs> when you're happy, you never go like this. You look to heaven. <laughs> That's so beautiful. Even if you think you're an atheist. That's so it's inbred in our nature. It's needed in our nature. To be sure, the geocentrist outlook commends itself to simple and untutored minds, as we have been reminded often enough. And moreover, accords with the understanding of sages and saints. What is new that has sent shockwaves through the scientific establishment is that empirical findings in the domain of astrophysics have begun irrevocably to side with the aforesaid simpletons. Einsteinian physics and quantum theory cannot coexist. It is important to note that in this regard, quantum theory constitutes the polar opposite of Einsteinian physics. For it is clear that the physics of Max Planck and Werner Heisenberg has imposed itself upon the scientific community, not on the strengths of ideological premises, but on the basis of incontrovertible findings that transgress the assumptions of Newtonian physics. It should surprise no one, therefore, that in the end it is quantum theory that prevails. It is nature, after all, that has the last word. Reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. 
My friend, Wolfgang Smith, has taught me to never ever forget that the cosmos and everything in it at every second is being both brought into existence and held in existence by something incomparably higher than those aspects of reality which can be reduced to an equation. Do I love Professor Wolfgang. I love him, I love him. This is the least I can say. <laughs> I believe he's a a great heart. He's very sincere, very honest, and he is telling you the truth the best he can. A man like this, you can find one or two in a century. Please listen to him because your life depends on it. The life of this nation depends on it.